Ignite your curiosity with Austin next. We're watching Austin transform from a thriving ecosystem into a global superstar. With our host, Jason Scharf, we aspire to better comprehend the true nature of innovation. Together, we will uncover what makes a successful ecosystem and navigate the technologies shaping our future. Now let's dive into what's next. Today's podcast is sponsored by Austin Private Wealth, a registered investment advisor focused on fee-only financial planning and investment management. Their mission is to serve affluent clients with personalized financial advice, fostering a trusted relationship that will endure for generations to come. Austin Private Wealth is not just about managing wealth, they're about inspiring you to embrace a future filled with possibilities and helping you architect enduring legacies. Their core values of integrity, service, caring, excellence, and growth are at the heart of everything they do. Connect with them today at austinprivatewealth.com. Austin Private Wealth is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Austin Private Wealth and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. No advice may be rendered by Austin Private Wealth unless a client service agreement is in place. Investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional. Creativity is a key ingredient in innovation and the community both inside and outside the technology sector plays a significant role. Where does the intersection between art and technology occur? What forms does it take, and how do we drive it to benefit of artists, innovators, and residents? To address these questions, we talk with Constance White, manager of the Art and Public Places program for the City of Austin. Constance is a nationally recognized public art management professional with over 20 years of experience dedicated to the field. She's worked for both public and private organizations in Texas, D.C., Southern California, Alabama, and the Carolinas. Career highlights include developing and implementing a $10 million public art plan as part of a $1 billion capital program for the San Diego International Airport. Constance has served as an advisor, presenter, and panelist for numerous organizations, including the American Association of Airport Executives, Americans for the Arts, the Public Art Coalition of Southern California, Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, and the City of Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs. Now at the helm of art and public cases for the City of Austin, Constance is driven to supporting and expanding the role of public art throughout the greater Austin metro. Constance, welcome to the Austin Next Podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So let's start off. Tell me about the City of Austin's Art and Public Places program. Wow, there's so much to say. How much time do we have? The City of Austin has the oldest, most established percent for art program in the state of Texas. The program launched in 1985. The program will be 40 years in two years. And so we're really excited to be thinking about... Big bash coming, right? Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) we're going to have a party. So stay tuned for more of that. We are a program of economic development, and we are in the cultural arts division. And so there are some some layers to where we are. But um, right now I have... A staff of five, so I have a collection manager and four project managers. By and large, our funding is generated through capital improvement projects, and it is referred to as a percent for art program, which is an industry term. So Austin has, by ordinance, allocated 2% of capital construction costs to public art. And where does that sit in terms of, is that an average rate for, you know, these types of programs? Are we spending more? Are we spending less? How does that kind of work? Average is about 1%, uh, depending on the community. You know, when the programs were started, what the leadership looked like, how they prioritized art in public places or public art. Coming from San Diego, they have a 2%, not only for the city, but also the airport, which is an independent authority. And so the it ranges from city to city, but 1% is about a general average across the country. 2% is exceptional. And since you said it's a percentage of capital improvement projects, as we are a booming city, I would assume as an absolute figure, 2% of a growing number is probably an even larger number. So does, how do we kind of stack up from that perspective? Or am I seeing it wrong? Oh, no, you're seeing it very clearly. We stack up great. We stack up very well. So from the airport, which is a Department of Aviation, to the convention center, so two really big departments within the city, but you think about public works and parks and recreation throughout Every council district, there are some improvements that are being made. 
Now, there are some ineligible costs that reduce the calculation, but by and large, with all of the boom that's happening in this town, we have a really prolific budget. So you said that the project or the the program sits under economic development. So walk me through the actual goals of the program. Wow. I just established my goals. I didn't commit them to memory, but I can tell you uh, part of what we do is contribute to the quality of life for all of the city's citizens of Austin. We work to make uh, visual art more accessible to our residents and also to the visitors to the city. So we'd like to think that we contribute to tourism. I would say that Before I moved here in March, I came to Austin as a tourist, and I was on a tour bus, and they talked about public art on the tour bus, which I thought was really exceptional because that is not something that is usual in my experience as a traveler and as a tourist. So I was really excited about that. We also take it very seriously in thinking about cultivating opportunities for local artists to think about working as an artist in the city of Austin. So retaining that creative edge and contributing to that as part of their income generation is important as well. So when we're thinking about scoping projects and allocating opportunities for local artists, that's one of the priorities that we consider. Art's a very, very broad term, as we were joking about before we started, as someone who's more of a writer than a visual artist. As I think about programs like this, obviously visual art is what comes to mind, murals, paintings, sculptures, but how do other forms, music, literature, digital fit into this program or do they not? Generally for public art, they can, but because Austin has so many other funding streams, opportunities and grant opportunities as well, uh, we have a whole division that's dedicated to supporting music um, and also preservation, historic preservation. There are other grant opportunities for um, small, midsize and large organizations. And so by and large, Percent for Art is for uh, visual artists, but there's always room for collaboration. And so depending on the scope of the project, the siting of the project, and also the type of community engagement, that's where technology can come in. And thinking about the level of interaction with the art and the public, it doesn't have to be just a standalone visual object that you engage. It could have a different level of engagement as well. So we're talking a lot in the abstract. Is there a certain flair narrative that is like, this is the Austin visual art kind of community scene that's coming into the public arts? I know a lot from when I've gone, obviously the murals, are kind of a big part of what we've seen both on the public spaces and the the private spaces. But how would you define kind of the the visual art being here since, you know, March? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, of course, you go back to the moniker of keeping Austin weird. There's a hodgepodge of just about everything from, you know, an abstract mosaic bat that's installed in the median of, you know, a street median. There are the murals as well. There is a prolific amount of murals. The city of Austin has commissioned a lot of murals, permanent and temporary. There are other organizations and neighborhood associations that work with artists to create murals as well. So I would say by and large, the murals are the most visible aspect of what we have in our collection. On the street level, if you're downtown, you'll see streetscapes. There are things that are inlaid in the concrete. So things that make you look down, things that make you look up, um, and things that are on a lot of, you know, just human scale in general, just to call attention to the environment and your surroundings. And so I would say that if I needed to describe the, the texture of what we have in our collection, it is designed for more of a human experience, but media and thematically, it runs the gamut. Over the next two years, starting probably the end of the first quarter of 23, we'll start a community civic-wide planning process and maybe drive towards something that looks more like, how can we define our collection or the future of what we would want to have as a definition or a scope um, for how we think about art in public places for the city of Austin. 
So what generally is like the process? Like how does this kind of work? Is it we're doing two or three pieces a year? There's a call, like how, you know, we do one piece every other, like how does this all kind of work? Obviously it's associated with the capital improvement project. So that's the, the first part of the, the step that goes through. So let's see, we're almost 40 years old. There's over 400 distinct and unique objects and installations in the collection right now. It's not a bad pace, 10 a year, you know. Uh, so growing a little bit, uh, we currently have about 60, 60 open contracts. Wow. Right now, we just issued open calls for nine distinct sites or open call opportunities that are I think 21 different projects. And uh, first quarter of next year, we'll have five new opportunities. Second quarter, we're looking at somewhere between five and seven. Not only is it growing, but the pace at which it's growing seems to be increasing. Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, the goal is to have the artwork integrated within the construction of the project of the site. And so that we not only have these distinct and unique objects and pieces, but we also have integrated experiences. And so it isn't just a sculpture here, a mural there, although I think that's very important when the opportunity calls for it. But if we can advance our work where the artists can elevate their capacities working with a design team and a construction team, then it becomes more of a complete project for the experience, not only vehicular, but also pedestrian. And so how do you marry that aspect of you want the creativity of the artist that you're bringing in, the project, whatever, it has a particular purpose. Are they coming in as I am pitching you as me, the artist, and we want to do something, or I'm pitching you a particular, this is what I want to do? Like, how does that kind of come together? It comes together in myriad ways. And so, I mean, they, I love airports. I love art in airports. And so we'll just go there because I've done work in three or four different airports. Right, the, we don't want like a giant middle finger showing up <laughs> as somebody lands in the airport, right? So there's some sort of marrying of like, it's got to be welcoming. I mean, it's Austin. So, you, okay. know, I, you know, we would not allow that to happen though. However, there are some uh, more expressive installations in public spaces, depending on what communities you're in. And I would say that, um, yep, sometimes the artists are just given free reign. Like if you want a sculpture, we're, we want a gateway and we want something that really speaks to the community. So what did you come up with? And so one that was really controversial, and I forget how many years ago this was, was the Bronco outside of Colorado's airport. And it's this larger than life fiberglass Bronco that has these glowing red eyes. And it's very, um, the gender of the horse is very prominent in its posture. And so- I've been in the Denver airport and they've been outside, but now I was like, I need to, <laughs> I'm to Google this image. Like, what do we and got so here? The, but it was, it's a really renowned piece. It was created by a really renowned Chicano artist. And that was the last work that he did. And so it's really priceless. It's priceless culturally. It has had a lot of conversation about appropriateness and what the community wants or didn't want, but it's still there. And so in that case, like the artist was kind of given some agency to create something that spoke to his perspective of you know, culture, site, and place. Generally, if the project is more integrated in the site, the artist being a part of the design team, you start with a scope that invites the artist to compete for this opportunity as an open solicitation. And in that scope, it's a project description, like a job description. This is what we want to accomplish. Uh, sometimes it says, you know, we want a sculpture or something two-dimensional. Sometimes it's wide open. Uh, sometimes we work with artists based on a proposal. We pay them for a proposal fee. Sometimes it's just based on an interview with no proposal. But if the artist is working with a design team, which generally architects, engineers, and other contractors, then we talk about the feasibility of ideas and concepts and what can happen within the budget and the timelines that we have. I found it interesting that your group is within the Economic Development Department. As normally an economic development part, and you even talked about this, is as outward looking. But when you describe the pieces and the location, 
and what you're trying to do, you're very, very focused on Austin and Austinites. Yes and no. There is a desire to cultivate the talent here and to provide opportunities for the talent that's here. Recognizing that the cost of living for everyone, including creatives, can be a little prohibitive to your creative process, like just thinking about a livable wage, right? And the city recognizes through the work that economic development does that talent is leaving, leaving the city proper and moving out to the suburbs or leaving the region just for affordability. And so if we can contribute to like some of that talent retention by offering more projects that are appealing, now public art, you know, one contract for a half million dollars is not going to sustain your life, right? Because the way it is a contract, they aren't grants. And so there are restrictions and how you can use and spend the money. Uh, We have deliverables, contract deliverables, like any other contractor that needs to be met and requirements that, you know, just things need to be paid for because public art, you know, they're like small construction projects. You are building things. But it's important to contribute to the bottom line of the artists that live here. And it's interesting because you brought up a great point and it makes a lot of sense in terms of economic development and the talent within Austin. But I was thinking in terms of the people actually viewing it. Because when you talk about going down a street and you have something embedded in the street to make you look down and something that makes you look up, that's more for the people that are here. Physically the, the here. Audience. Yes. Yeah. But if you're a visitor and you're a tourist downtown um, and you're looking for things to look at, then being a tourist and seeing things to look at is a whole experience. Um, and so there's a virtual guided tour online for downtown to see public art and you bump into it. There's a statue of Willie Nelson was, I think was the first statue of him ever created downtown. And so it's a little bit of a treasure find, a scavenger hunt. Again, as a tourist, I like to think that I date the city of Austin. We're getting to know each other. And I love these quirky discoveries as I am walking around looking at the city with fresh eyes, someone who is new, uh, a new resident that's here. And so I think that contributing to tourism, if you stay at the Hyatt Regency, then you can go on a walkabout. And have these discoveries. We just welcomed uh, a delegation from Angers, Angers, France. And uh, and they were very interested in public art and art in public places. And they did a guided tour. They prefer to just have a conversation one-on-one with me and then find their way, have their own self-discovery with the public art downtown, as opposed to me being a tour guide. And so, and I just received an email from them about how much they enjoyed that discovery and that experience. And so it is both inward and outward. Interesting. I'm going to have to find that that website and do a couple of those tours because my wife and I love walking around cities. Oh, awesome. It's really easy to find. And um, and I'll send that to you in one of the, the links. Yeah, for sure. I want to go kind of up a level and do a little little bit more esoteric because there's a lot of research that talks about regions with high creative input also are highly creative when it comes to innovation. And that's always been the topic of the podcast is the Austin ecosystem, the Austin innovation system. How does both the support of our artistic community, whether it's the Art and Public Spaces program or some of the other programs, interact with the innovators we have in other areas, in technology, in medicine, in rocket ships, and all the rest. We haven't gotten to medicine yet, but I'm assuming it's not too far away. But, or and, there are maybe three artists under contract right now that are working on quarter projects that are considering some type of technology interaction, mostly an, an AR Um, augmented reality experience. And so that these long stretches of corridors like Airport Boulevard, MLK Boulevard, North Lamar, just thinking about like you're you're not going to be using your phone to try to have an experience, but there are pedestrians that walk 
around the areas. And the quarters program is wanting to create these nodes of placemaking for the pedestrians that are, you know, crossing the street or going shopping or whatever they're doing. And there's a respite of art that's there. And so if you're waiting, whether you're waiting for two minutes for a traffic signal to change or you're waiting on some other mode of transportation, whether it's a rail or a bus, then you could use your device to have an experience uh, that's layered on top of whatever the visual aspect is already there. And so we are working with the artists to explore that. Um, For me, the challenge is the archival aspect of uh, the technology. Um, The way our projects are funded, the work is required to be installed and maintained for at least 20 years. That's the lifespan. And so how do we think about that with technology? Do we think about it in iterations? How do we think about privacy, in-app purchases? Who's maintaining it? Who's updating it? How do broken links get tended to when the city wants ownership over the, not the intellectual property, but the actual physical aspects of what it is. And by nature of like, I'm guilty, I've never read my entire Apple privacy statement, but you have to indemnify the city on whatever your agreements are within your clauses for whatever the technology is. And so that's another layer that kind of complicates the creative process, but we are on the edge of doing that. And so we've engaged our technology department, we've engaged our public information department to say, if we are the Silicon you know, Hill of the South, whatever that moniker is that's being thrown out there. We need, we need a new moniker. We just I, call it Austin, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> It's a, it's a personal thing of always, I've just, uh, I understand the origin of Silicon Hills, but it's always been like, we want to be the first Austin, not the next Silicon Valley. So I've exactly. never liked the Silicon Alley, Silicon Hills, Silicon Beach. I'm like, we're something else, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But if we're, if we are touting, you know, that we are a place for innovation and technology, then I think our visual artifacts, our art should reflect that. And so we have artists that are definitely asking questions, can I and what if? And we're like, maybe, yes, and let us let us discover and create with you. It does create an interesting tension where if you have a, you know, in the historic mediums, paint, sculpture, the permanency of it is easy to create, right? When you have something that's built off of a technology base that is so rapidly iterating, you're like, oh, yeah, we have this, but now, you know, three years later, it's, you know, the the new OS doesn't support this, and how do we kind of figure that out? And it becomes much more of a, a back and forth. Trying to maintain something for 20 years in the technology space is almost impossible. Well, even in the physical space, you think about our buildings, the streets, how often have we, dri- especially in Texas, how often have you driven down the street and that you were like, didn't they just pave that street like a year ago, two years ago, and it's being repaved just because of the heat, you know, and the extreme temperatures. And so thinking about art as a part of the built environment, as a part of the public infrastructure and needing to maintain it, like, do we have separate servers for technology for the art? Do I need to hire of someone who is skilled in computer like technology or coding and things like that to my staff. And so those are things that in the field of public art, this is not a new conversation. We've been thinking about this for about, you know, maybe 20 years or so. Do you see this as an opportunity for forward-looking and inspiration for the city as a whole? So if we have to deal with these kinds of technological issues in our art and public places uh, program, maybe we should also be thinking about this in the 900 other departments and how do we deal with those kind of the technological innovations and things that we're building from, right? I'm still making my rounds to meet the directors of those departments, so I will not speak for um, all of the leadership of the city. But And since but, everybody is just listening, you didn't see the, the beaming smile on Constance's face <laughs> when she was asked that question. <laughs> I believe that we should all have a collaborative effort for progress. And oftentimes things happen 
within the field of art that will spark innovation, change, and consideration for other other places, other departments, other divisions. And so I think that we are not working in a silo. And so um, just based on my experience and my team working with the artists that want to push the envelope of technology, I said, you know, call whoever you know in GIS or our tech departments to say, hey, what do you think about this? And so that starts a little domino. And um, so, yeah. Are you getting a good reaction? Oh, absolutely. My experience in Austin is like, how can we help? Like, yes, let's do it. How do we do it? Let's figure it out. For me, that's really exciting because I love to collaborate. And I know that between the three of us in this room, if we were speculating some opportunity, we would come up with ideas that we would, we would not have come up with individually. So we become our own mini kind of incubator of thoughts in that partnership. And so I really enjoy that within the city, the big C, the city as an institution, but also on the on the boots on the ground, the city little C with all of the artists and folks, though even the Uber drivers that I interview and talk to. That's a great segue because I wanted to ask, how do you think we as a city, little C, can build those bridges between the tech innovator kind of group and the creative kind of group? Where are the areas where we can promote those amazing collisions that can happen? I think on a kind of a micro level, that synergy is happening. I think folks in the tech industry, um, I'm not sure about all of the executives, but the programmers, the, you know, the code writers, I think they're creatives. You know, they're, they're solving problems. They're looking for solutions. They're thinking about the future. And I think artists, you know, visual artists, performing artists, we all live in that dream space. And so I think that that's happening. Now, can we create create opportunities to catalyze that, to uh, further incubate that? Um, I think the city is thinking about that as well um, in addressing larger issues, larger social issues like housing. How can we create ordinances that um, create spaces for creatives to work, to live, to play. And so as the city begins to codify those types of, you know, requirements for developers, then when creatives have spaces to do things, then, you know, unimaginable things happen, I think. I have two words there. Faster, please. (laughs) I've only been here for 113 days. I know. (laughs) But it's not all on you. It's okay. You're right. <laughs> so we talked a lot about the kind of the the little C a city, but and then you said in the beginning about how one of the reasons is we wanted to keep talent both in the city proper uh, and then in overall in the metro. How do you think about that interaction? Because one of the things that we're seeing, we've explored a bit on the podcast, is how the Austin Metro is booming as both a place to be and an innovation powerhouse. And you have it from Georgetown to San Marcos to Bastrop. So it's not just the city proper. So where do you see that interaction space being between here and the uh, the suburbs that continue to grow? I mean, I, I think it was interesting when the census data that 50, it was almost 50-50 the size of the metro, 50% being the city and 50% being you know the other cities. So where do you see that going? Well, I, so in the, the, you know, the short amount of time that I've been here and I'm all over the place because this is my only reason for being here. This is my purpose. I meet people. I meet city managers and council people uh, from those areas, you know, at a dinner party, you know, an art opening and just by networking, you know, we're, we, we are relational and the Arts are, you know, we're we're a small ecosystem of folks. And so just in conversation, it's like, what are you doing? What have you done? Where have you been? Where are you coming from? And I like to tell people I'm new. I like to tell people, you know, I've been here for however many days. And people are curious. Why are you here? 
And I'm very fortunate that I have a lot of experience. I've worked in a lot of different markets and that sparks even more curiosity. So even last night, I was on a call with a a small town that is uh, not too far from here. And one of their city managers reached out to just whoever the person would be sitting in this position would have had a similar conversation, but they wanted to start a public art program. Um, and asked, like, what does that look like for our teeny tiny population? Um, well, I can't commit to being on their steering committee or their public art uh, board, but I could commit to having a kickoff meeting with their town leaders. And so we did that last night. We had a focus group meeting. They have um, some tax money that they've been holding on to in their coffers, and they've just done a like a town center. And they want to make an investment. So we talked about planning. We talked about being proactive and community engagement and some strategic ways to um, be relevant, but for the art program to grow with the city and not to be uh, reactive, but proactive. And so I think leadership is important and inviting um a multitude of visions and perspectives to the table and being available for those types of conversations. Not, I'm a consultant, but I, you know, I wasn't, I'm not being paid for those conversations. I feel like that's part of why I am here. And so it isn't just about um, the work that I'm doing for the city, Big C, but in my other roles in Dallas and San Diego and the Carolinas, it's about, you know, the place is more than just that, the place where I receive my paycheck. Um, and if I can't partner and network with and influence, you know, with my colleagues in partnering areas, then um, then that creates even more of an isolating effect. Because when people come to Austin, they go to these other places too. So I think that's important. So we talked a lot about, you know, where where the art is going and technology and the AR. Going to get a little controversial now. We've seen a lot uh, in the last few months with these uh, AI systems and Dolly and Imogen and Midjourney. How do you see that type of technology playing out, dealing, uh, working, you know, I don't think it's going to replace artists, but working with artists, where are you seeing that? And what generally is the, what you've seen, the reaction from some of the community? Uh, well, my reactions have been limited with the community because it's been the art community that I've experienced reactions. And people are fascinated with technology. They're fascinated with the, you know, with the fourth dimension, another opportunity to create. And also it has a different maintenance implication. It has a different lifespan. It's time-based. You know, you could do a pop-up experience, um, thinking about whatever limited infrastructure, download an app, whatever your responsibility is with the app and all of the things that you accept with downloading an app. But you and I can experience the same kind of thing in a place that is virtual, but we're in the same place, right? We're physically in the same place, but the thing is there, but not there, right? And so we can be in dialogue, interfacing with this experience, and that creates an entirely different interaction than a fixed object uh, in a space. So I was in um, San Diego last October, I believe, and their botanical gardens had an AI um, or AR installation, world-renowned artist. And some of them were very serious, some were kind of spooky, some you can walk through in and around. But just to hear like out loud how people were responding to the installations, but also the sense of curiosity that it provoked to pull you through the site and the place. It was, um, to me, it was very fascinating. And to know that it's there for a limited time drew even more people to the space to have this experience. And so I think, um, you know, people like it. We'll see how it happens. Yeah. We always ask our guests the same question. And 
like us, you're new here relatively. Constance, what's next for Austin? Oh, what's next for Austin? There is so much that's next for Austin that I wish I could transcribe all of the thoughts that just influxed in my brain. I can tell you for art in public places, you'll see larger statements. You'll see a lot more community engagement as well. And you'll see the beginnings of the um, of an implementation of a new plan that takes into consideration technology and how the world is advancing and growing, but still being inclusive of public input and local artists. So while we're hyper-local in what we think, but we're also a global place and a global, global gateway. And so what's next is continuing to be open to the world of ideas, but also understanding the portal of influence from our local artists and our local constituents. I will tell you, I for one cannot think of a better person to have here as the leader of our art in public places uh, efforts in Austin. Thank you so much for being on the Austin Next podcast. Thank you. Thank you both. I've enjoyed this very much. So what's next, Austin? We're glad you've joined us on this journey. Please subscribe at your favorite podcast catcher. Leave us a review and let your colleagues know about us. This will help us grow the podcast and continue bringing you unique interviews and insights. Thanks again for listening and see you soon.